If you were able to walk into a room confident that you would be well received, seen, heard, and appreciated by others, and all it took was a few changes in how you navigate your everyday relationships, would you be willing to make those changes? It is possible to be both fully authentic and to experience the best relationships of your life. Now, here is the host of Navigating Complicated Relationships with behavior expert, Michaela Gaffin-Stone. Hey, welcome everyone. I'm so glad you're here for Navigating Complicated Relationships. Today's complicated relationship is the one between you and your food and your weight and your body image and all those kind of things. I have called it why we overeat because I think that's a very important thing to examine. Now I'm a nutrition coach and I'm also a board certified behavior analyst. So I bring the, the science of behavior change and the science that dissects basically, how do you behave? Why do you do these things? What results do you get from that behavior? And Where's it coming from? Because there's always a motivation for behavior, right? There's always a reason for it. It doesn't come out of a vacuum. And you will sometimes hear people say, oh, that came out of nowhere. Well, I'm here to tell you that absolutely, scientifically, no, that is not true. It came out of somewhere. So when it comes to overeating, where's it coming from? I mean, do you find yourself wondering why you overeat, even while you're reaching for more food? You might not be hungry, but something somewhere is telling you, eat more, eat more. Well, why does that happen? Do you have any thoughts on the subject? I do, and I'm going to be getting into that. But the first thing I want you to know is you're not alone. So many people have that, and, and they will have it at different times. It might not be there all the time. But, you know, there are, there are some obvious reasons for overeating, and there are some hidden reasons for overeating and they come up at different times depending on what's happening in your life your thoughts about what's happening in your life and so on there are there are other factors as well and we're going to get into the marketing and the food industries a bit later but overeating is something that tends to be complex it's multifaceted just like you right you're complex you're multifaceted so it makes sense when you think about it that it's not just an easy fix, right? Because it's not an easy problem. And this is one of the things where diets fail miserably because that, my friend, is how they are designed. Diets, traditional diets that are designed for you to lose weight will probably work in the short term if you are able to stick to the sometimes bizarre rules. <laughs> There's some pretty restricted rules. And have you noticed how many times these diets will have special products and specially approved foods that you can only buy through them and that kind of thing or supplements that you have to take in order to get your goals reached? Well, what is that? Like if you have to take special supplements in order to reach a food related goal then something in what you're eating is missing right and if a diet is intentionally having you miss stuff can, can you have any red flags going off yet because i have screaming sirens in the back of my head like that is something that is deeply flawed before you even begin and then the other part that's hugely flawed in every single diet ever I don't care which one it is. Pick one up, look at it and tell me where the behavior change is. Tell me where the understanding of the human psyche and the emotional connection to food is. It typically isn't anywhere to be seen. So you can't change something if you don't know why you're doing it and you don't know what to change it to. And here's a, a key for you as well. You're not going to know what to change something to if you don't know why you're doing it, right? So an example I can give you is someone who eats popcorn to think of her mom. Now, I, I have a client right now whose mom passed away many years ago and while she was quite young. And the connection that she has 
is that every year on her mom's death anniversary, she'll have this massive bowl of popcorn, watch a particular movie and cry a lot, right? But that is her way of dealing with this very emotional event. And she has discovered using the, the program that I coach for 90 days where you get to understand your relationships with food, she's realized that actually that big bowl of popcorn isn't doing her any good whatsoever. And that planting flowers to honor her mom's memory is way more preferable. You know, her mom loved flowers so she can plant ones that are the particular colors her mom liked. It's something very beneficial for the garden, the bees, the eyes, you know, like you, you can enjoy all of that. And, and it's longer lasting, right? The bowl of popcorn wasn't really helpful for achieving any closure with emotions or any processing with emotions. And what it did do was cause allergies for her. It caused inflammation in her body, which leads to illness. So can you see how knowing what the popcorn does is a really key piece of no longer wanting the popcorn? It's not that I say you can't eat popcorn. That's terrible. I would dream of saying that because if I did, guess what the first thing is that you'd go and get? You'd go get the thing I told you you couldn't have, right? We're all like that. That little kid comes up in you and, and you're just like, you're not the boss of me. I'm going to eat popcorn all day today. You know, sure. OK. And then how do you feel? That's what I'm interested in. And then once you see that emotional connection, can we find something that's easier for you to do that you control? It doesn't control you. And that's the key. If you feel that there's a certain food that you have to eat, because you can't function without it. You know, how many people say, I got to have coffee in the morning. I'm not human until I've had my coffee. Okay. Are you happy with that? Or would you like to maybe look at that and see who are you without the coffee? And what is it you really need? Is it the morning ritual? Is it something hot to drink? Is it a psychological process of when I do this thing, it means, you know, I'm ready for my work day or what do you make it mean? That's the big question, right? Because something is pretty neutral until we make it mean something. Now, in the case of food, there are chemical reactions within the body that certain foods become addictive and that's a whole different thing. But right now I'm talking emotional addiction and where you've got these stories that become your identity, right? If you say, I have to have coffee, otherwise I'm not human. Okay, that's an interesting identity, right? And can you see how when you say those things, your brain believes you because it's just going to take what you tell it and, and run with it. It's not going to judge it and say, well, that's silly. It, it's just going to take it and say, okay, yeah, you do need coffee because... That's what you said. So here you go, go make more coffee. And, and you're getting all this caffeine and all this input. Is it helping you the way your story says it is? Or is it just there because that's part of your identity now? I have another client who was telling me that he thought coffee made him more productive. And he went off coffee for a while to see what that was like, and then put coffee back in to his daily routine and spent last week drinking coffee, funnily enough, and just said to me this morning, you know what? I actually really wasn't more productive. I was just anxious. And I kept thinking of all these things that could go wrong and all these problems. And normally I wouldn't think of those, but it came up because he'd had coffee and the caffeine's kind of stimulating the brain and getting all kinds of things going that aren't productive, but they're certainly going. So, is it really the stimulant of the coffee that makes you feel like, OK, I'm all jittery, so I must be doing something? If, if you can take a step back and look at that, then sometimes you can see a very different picture. And that's what I like to do with my coaching. That's my big purpose is to break the chains of emotional eating so that you can have literally have food freedom, meaning if you want to have a coffee because you want to have a coffee, have your coffee. Enjoy it. Cool. 
that's great. But if you are having coffee because you have to have coffee, that's where I'm going to say, you know what, let's have a little time out and look at that and just see who, who's in control because right now it's the coffee. And do you really want to give your power up like that? If you do, I mean, where else are you giving up your power? So this spreads out into other things in life, which is why it's so important. And it also affects your health, right? So there's the emotional eating piece for sure. And we all have something. You might not think you do, but think back to when you were a child. If you fell over and scraped your knee, for example, and nobody was looking, or you, you were just out with a bunch of friends and nobody paid attention, you'd probably just get up and keep going right? Maybe brush the gravel and the blood off your knees and, and then keep playing. But if the same thing happens and you look around and mom's watching and maybe the neighbor's watching and some other adults are watching, now you're going to have a meltdown, right? Big tears, lots of, oh, I'm so sad and I hurt and ah. And adults don't like it when that happens with their kids. So what do they do? They go get you a cookie or they promise you some cake or they, you know, promise you an ice cream. And then you go get that thing and you learn really early on to associate comfort and reward with fat and sugar really early on. And it's every parent does this. It's not a neglect thing. It's not being mean. Quite the opposite. It's an instinctive I want my child to feel better. How do I make them feel better? Here, eat something. Because your parent was also raised that way, right? So it's it's a lot to expect a parent not to do that. And the only way they're going to not teach their child to emotionally eat is by breaking the chain for themselves. So this is another reason to learn where your emotional eating triggers are so that you don't have to pass them on to your kids. Or if you see it being passed on, you can call it and, and explain with, with all the love in the world why this is a bad idea, right? Then there's the emotional eating trigger of everybody who grew up with the clean plate club, right? There are starving kids in Africa. There are starving kids over here. And somehow when you ask to mail your peas to them, you get into trouble because that's not how you're supposed to respond. But it's a reasonable response because every kid I've ever known has had the same one, right? Whatever country they're in. But the, the overall thing is you learn you can't leave food on your plate. It's wasteful. It's a bad thing to leave food on your plate. And then when you become a mom or you become a dad and you're responsible for your kids' food, do you clean their plates too? I bet you do because that story is still running where you can't waste the food. But think about it. Is it a waste of food to throw it away? Or is it a waste of food to eat it when you don't need it and add on weight to your own body and maybe some inflammation? I mean, what are you doing with that leftover food? Are you the trash can? That's a really big question, right? And so many parents are because they have this long standing story from childhood, I can't throw food away. I can't waste food. It's a bad thing to do. And that's the clean plate club. Now I'd love to know if you're a member of that because yeah, most people I've met are. And what do you think about that now that you know you're a member of the clean plate club? Are you a little bit annoyed? Do you want to change that? Because there are ways to break those chains. And that's my specialty, doing the behavior analysis and figuring out where things are happening over and over again that don't work for you. They're not serving you. So if you can break those chains, how much is that worth to your quality of life? Ooh, big question, right? So stay tuned. We have a break coming up. You are listening to Michaela Gaffin Stone. I'm your host at Navigating Complicated Relationships. And today we're talking about why we overeat. All the reasons around that, there's so many. I'll see you in a minute. What if your relationships could be a source of delight instead of a source of struggle? 
In a world where human interactions are anything but straightforward, tuning in to Navigating Complicated Relationships with behavior expert Michaela Gaffin-Stone will offer you insights, tools, and a whole new level of understanding for you to use right now. Listen for Navigating Complicated Relationships with Michaela Gaffin-Stone, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. This is Navigating Complicated Relationships with Michaela Gaffin Stone. To participate in the program, join the live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You can also send an email to Mickey at gaffinstone.com. Now back to the program. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're still here. You are listening to me, your host, Michaela Gaffin-Stone. And if you would like to email me, it's Mickey, M-I-K-K-I, because I'm not a mouse, at gaffinstone.com, G-A-F-F-E-N, stone, like a rock, dot com. And I'm very responsive to your email. So if you want to let me know what you think about the topics so far, what you'd like to hear next, uh, questions that you have or comments, I am very receptive and would love to hear what you think. It's the way of me figuring out what you'd like to hear next, right? Uh, talking into the void isn't that helpful. Talking and getting responses is great. Speaking of which, someone in the chat said that, yes, they had been a member of the Clean Plate Club and had changed that. Now, that's the kind of control and empowerment I'm talking about. That's what you need. And if you're not going to raise kids to emotionally eat and have all these health problems that really have no idea where they came from or why, well, it's probably what they're eating and also how much they're eating. We, we eat when we feel sad. We eat when we feel stressed or lonely or, you know, what, what do you do if you're in a relationship and you've just had a breakup? Can I hear tub of Ben and Jerry's? Yeah. You know, and every rom-com ever shows that happening at some point where somebody, you know, pigs out on this massive thing of ice cream. Why? And why does everybody think that's OK? Because it's an accepted emotional eating response. But is it healthy? Is it helpful? Does it make anything different other than chances are you're going to have a really upset stomach? because most people are lactose intolerant at some level. Now, you might not know you're lactose intolerant. It might not be to a big extent where you get all these sort of obvious digestive problems, but there's another thing that happens with chronic overeating, and that is you get used to a certain level of feeling unwell, and you no longer realize that you don't feel good. That's just normal for you now. And it's only when you break out of that and rise to a newer level of health that you realize, holy smokes, did I feel that bad all the time? I did. How did I ever get anything done? You know, and you have all these questions come up like, how many years did I feel like crap? And it, the answer is probably a lot of them. A lot will depend on where you live and what kind of foods are eaten culturally around you. But if you're in the US, the chances are you're eating the SAD diet, which is the standard American diet. And that includes a lot of fast foods, high fat, high sugar, quick delivery. You know, you're not savoring it. You're stuffing it down while you're in the car on the way to soccer practice or something. So we have excuses for why we eat badly and why we treat ourselves badly by doing so. But it's all in the name of being busy. 
And that's something that's culturally very acceptable, right? But is it healthy for you, for your kids, for anybody around you? Do you ever think of taking a break and maybe, I don't know, cooking a decent meal at home? A lot of people in the US don't even cook. And that is a, a basic skill that I believe everybody should be able to cook. You need to eat, therefore you should be able to cook. It's not a complex thing, but marketing, the food industry will tell you, oh, you don't have time for that. You're too busy to do that. Here, have an app on your phone and you can just press a button and your order will be ready to deliver. Like you don't even have to pick your order each time anymore. You can just hit the, I'll have the usual, and, and it'll be there. And you drive through and kind of grab it as you go past and, and off you go. Companies are making it easier and easier to buy food products on the go and to consume them on the go. And they market it with this whole idea of, hey, you're so successful and busy that you have to do this. But is that really true? And is it serving you? Is it healthy for you to sit in the car and shovel food down while you're driving? I think not. You know, your, your digestive system isn't getting particularly good signals when you're shoveling food down so fast, you can't digest it properly. And then another client of mine mentioned her son this week, and, and he asked if he could have some help losing weight. Now, He's a pretty big guy, so I can see his concern that, you know, maybe he's having some health issues. And she said, but, you know, the problem is he eats dinner and then goes straight to bed because of the time he comes in from work and then how early he gets up the next day to go to work. So he has no time to eat in the evening and then rest. Well, here's the thing with that scenario. You're going to go to bed your digestive system wants to digest the food you've just eaten, but you're telling it to rest, right? You're trying to sleep. Well, your digestive system can't do both of those things at once. It does one or the other. So either your digestion suffers, and this is where you start getting acid reflux and all kinds of issues with how regularly you go to the toilet and that kind of thing, or so many things can come up from that because you're not digesting your food properly or you get some digestion going, but then you can't sleep worth anything. So the next day you get up tired and guess what you do? You go straight for the high fat, high sugar foods and start shoveling them in because you want something to give you that burst of energy and keep going. Does that sound like a healthy way to proceed to you? It sounds to me like a fast track to ill health that's going to make you take a break. And that's really, if you don't have to do it that way, why would you choose it? There are other options, right? So we typically should stop eating around three hours before bedtime so that you have time to digest the food before you go to sleep. And that, that should work for most people without needing nighttime snacks and stuff. If you're eating the right foods during the day. Now that brings me to another reason why people overeat, what happens, and, and why it's so epidemic. You could even say pandemic at this point because it's all over the world, but let's st stick to the US for a moment and, and have a look at the epidemic there. So what happens is with these fast foods that I've mentioned, they're high in fat, they're high in salt, there's sugar in pretty well everything. So all of these things really get your taste buds going and they're sending signals to the brain, to the reward center, you know, eat more. Oh, yeah, this is this is what we need, eat more. And your brain is saying, OK, where's my nutrition? Where is the stuff I need to make you? How do I repair you? How do I keep the systems going? If you're eating a lot of empty calories and you're eating a lot of fake food, which fast food tends to be, right? If you look at the list of chemicals on the back, tell me where that stuff comes in nature. Most of it doesn't. And if it's not a natural product, your body has no idea what to do with this thing. You can't tell it. It needs to know from an evolutionary point of view how this 
works in the body. What do, what do I take this molecule for and where am I going to put it? Well, if it's chemicals, where it's going to put it is stored in your liver because the liver can't metabolize it, it can't process it, or it's stored in the fat. Ooh, okay, so now you've got another problem coming up, which I'll get to in just a moment. But meanwhile, you're eating these calories, so say you're having this fast food and tons of calories in there, but there's not a lot of nutrition. It's very specific and there's big, big gaps in, in what you need to be consuming. So your body says, hey, you know what? We still don't have what we need. Send the signal for more food. So the signal goes out in a hormonal form. And you're, you're like, you know what? I'm still hungry. I need more. Yeah, I know I had two of those giant burgers, but I need more. I'm still hungry. And it's not that that person's been greedy. It's not that that person has no self-control. That's not the issue. The problem is your body is still saying, yeah, man, I know we ate, but we don't have the nutrition we need. Go get some nutrition, eat more food. So you have to be discerning. Your brain isn't going to say, you know what, I'm really craving some celery right now. You have to figure out where the nutrition is and go get that. Another factor here is that food today doesn't have a lot of water in it because we're eating this ultra processed stuff. So if that's what forms most of your diet, then you need to drink a lot more water than you're currently drinking. And I would put money on it that you're not drinking enough water because you think that neon drink with the electrolytes in is, is doing you some good. It really isn't. If you have a look at the label on those things, you know, those sports drinks I'm talking about, you have a look on the label and one of the first ingredients, if not the first, is high fructose corn syrup. That is toxic for your body. Your body has no idea what to do with that. It's not helping you in any way, shape or form. And it's not water, so it's not hydrating you. If you're not drinking enough water, your, your poor kidneys are, are trying to do a job here and you're not giving it any material to work with. And if you're dehydrated, you're probably going to think you need more food because historically, evolutionary speaking, your brain is going to say, well, food has water in it, you know, go eat leaves and, and that will bring you some water, right? We don't have that now. So you really need to consider how much water do you drink in a day? And if you'd like to know how to anchor that habit, I can get into that in a moment or two after the break, but I'd like you to think about it for now. How much water do you drink in a day? Are you one of those people that says, I don't like water, I don't drink it? Eek! <laughs> That's something that you, you might want to work on if you want to have a long and healthy life. Because your body needs water. We are mostly made up of water. And if you're not keeping that substance going in your body, then, well, what do you anticipate for your long-term health? Medication? That, you know, the pharmaceutical industry are having a wonderful time producing medication to cover up for the things that we're missing in food and that we're missing by not drinking enough water. That doesn't make it OK. That makes the pharmaceutical industry complicit with the food industry to make us ill and keep us there. Now, this is just it's all out there. I'm not saying anything you can't go and research for yourself. And, and find the facts for yourself and just test it for yourself. If you drink more water, if you drink enough water during the day, say, have a glass, have a small glass every hour. Try something like that. See how you feel and how your eating is a little different, because it will be that the signals change when you're getting enough water. So I will give you some ideas about how to anchor in this new habit of drinking more water after our break, which is coming up momentarily. If you'd like to email me, please do, mickey at gaffinstone.com, and let me know what you think. I will see you in a minute. Don't go away. What if your relationships could be a source of delight instead of a source of struggle? In a world where human interactions are anything but straightforward, tuning in to Navigating Complicated Relationships with behavior expert Michaela Gaffinstone will offer you insights, tools, and a whole new level of understanding for you to use right now. Listen 
for Navigating Complicated Relationships with Michaela Gaffin Stone. Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. This is Navigating Complicated Relationships with Michaela Gaffin Stone. To participate in the program, join the live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You can also send an email to mickey at gaffinstone.com. Now back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. And you can find me on Facebook, too. I seem to be there quite a bit. So if you look up Michaela Gaffin Stone, you will find me on Facebook. I don't think there's another one with the same name and you'll soon recognize if you've got the right person. I don't think it's hard to find me, I'm not hidden. But what is hidden is a lot of rubbish in your food that is chemical and it makes you want to eat more and you forget to drink water. So if you wanna bring in that new habit of drinking more water, and it, it is a new habit for most people, then the secret is to anchor it to something you already do. So for example, if you are somebody that likes your coffee in the morning and you don't want to change that habit, it's your choice, right? I'm not here to judge you, I'm here to help you get control where you would like to have control. So if you make coffee in the morning and you have a coffee pot, I'm hoping you don't drink the instant stuff because please be nicer to yourself than that. So if you're going to make coffee, put a pitcher of water next to the coffee pot. And then when you go to get your coffee in the morning, you can grab the pitcher of water at the same time. There's no extra steps, right? Or if you have a big bottle that you drink from during the day, have it right next to the coffee. Or put it right next to wherever your breakfast lives. You know, if you have fruit in the morning, put it next to the fruit bowl. Like whatever that looks like, set yourself up for success by putting the new habit of more water with the current habit and start with the first thing you do in the day. So, you know, if you take medication in the morning, make sure you drink a full glass with that. Don't just have a little sip. Um, you know, if, if you skip breakfast, okay, I'm not gonna tell you differently, but if you work from home, put the water on your desk. You know, you can get the idea from this, right? We all have different scenarios. Find the one that works for you. And then it becomes a no brainer. You don't have to set your phone to remind you every hour or something irritating like that. You can just set up the place where you're going to get your water from, right? And that if you do nothing else, drink more water. That alone will really help. You know, we have shifted so much from a society of self-care to a society of health care that the questions have changed dramatically. You know, when I began my nursing career, and yes, I've done that too. When, when I began my nursing career, when someone came to be admitted to the hospital, we would ask them, do you have any medications? And they would typically say no, or, oh, well, I have this little yellow pill, you know, and then you have to ferret out what they're talking about. But it wasn't much, and it wasn't all the time. Now, if you're admitting a patient, the question is, what medications are you on? Now that whole frame is completely different. How have we moved in one generation from what are you on medication to what medication are you on? What's happened? And what's happened in this process is we're eating less healthy food, more chemicals, and the pharmaceutical industry is providing medicines to cover up those symptoms. And quite often people can end up on a stack of meds. And when you look at them, 
it's like this one takes away the side effect of that one, which works over here that gives you a side effect there. And a, a lot of them are simply to take away side effects of medication you're on. So if you are somebody who's on a lot of medication, I'd love to have a conversation with you to see where you are with your eating habits, where the emotional ties are and so on, and see if we have a program that's going to work for you. But the other thing is, I would invite you to go to your local pharmacist. If you have a friendly one, that would be good. Give them your list of medications and ask them to check them. Because sometimes you've got meds in there that you don't actually need. Or they the need for them would go away if this one was changed to a different version and didn't give you the side effects. So sometimes you can reduce your stack just by having it checked. Doctors are very busy. And they have, you know, what, nine minutes to talk to you, if that, for the most part. They're, they're not walking encyclopedias of medication. There's new stuff coming out all the time. And they don't necessarily sort of go through that whole process every time they talk to you. So it's up to you to go take that list to your pharmacist and ask them. But meanwhile, also ask about your food and, and what you're eating. If your doctor doesn't want to know what you're eating and drinking, then I'm going to question the value of their advice for you when it comes to your health, because this is a huge part of it, right? If you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, if you're not drinking well, well, of course you're sick. You can't be other than, right? And if you're overeating because you're full of empty calories, then you're just going to store the stuff that the body doesn't recognize as fat. And then if you do get to the point where you're releasing that fat, guess what happens next? You're losing weight. Yay. Why do I feel terrible? Ugh, I feel so sick. This is no good. I need to go back to eating the stuff I was eating before. Well, what's happening is as you're dropping the fat, the toxins are being released that have been stored in there. So, yeah, you feel terrible because that's the stuff you've eaten before. There's a process to go through that can limit how bad you feel. There is, there is a way of doing this that's not all miserable and cold turkey and, and generally feeling horrible. You know, I don't want to do that to you. I wouldn't do that to you. But that is what happens if you go on a traditional diet and you suddenly drop, you know, like five pounds in a week, you're probably not going to feel very good. So if that's happened to you, yeah, this would be why, right? So overeating becomes this big deal of who said what about food. You know, this is good food. This is bad food. You can eat this. You can't eat that. How many places do you see where there are lists of eat this, don't eat that? Right. Have you seen those lists? They're usually in magazines and so on. And they offer you swaps for things. Well, I got to tell you that cauliflower is not a trade for chocolate. It just isn't. They both begin with C and that's about it, right? So if you're craving chocolate and somebody says, don't eat that, here, have some cauliflower. You know what you're going to do? Best case scenario is you're going to eat the cauliflower and then you're going to go get the chocolate and you're going to eat the chocolate because that what the cauliflower wasn't what you wanted. The question is why do you want the chocolate? That's what you need to know is where does that come from? I have an example for myself where I used to eat chocolate every day and I decided to stop doing that for a while and see what would happen, you know, and who am I without the chocolate? How does that work? And I discovered that actually, no, I'm fine not eating chocolate. And then just a couple of weeks ago, I had this big task I had to do and it's very technical and I'm not very techy. And it was a royal pain. It was just, it was so difficult for me to do. And I finally got the wretched thing done. And I was relieved, but I also had this big emotion come up where I was just like, I want chocolate and I want it now. And even as that came up, I was like, that is hilarious. Like I haven't eaten chocolate in months. Where did that come from? And it, it was kind of funny, right? Because the emotion wasn't attached to this very old story that clicks in, right? It was like somebody flipped the switch 
and the story started playing, but there was no attachment to it. So I could see it for what it was. And it's like, wow, these old programs really hang around. How interesting is that? Now, if the emotional connection was still there, I would have gone and gotten a whacking great big bar of chocolate and downed the whole thing. No question. Would that have done me any good? No. Would that have resolved the emotion that came up? Also, no. If you're somebody who eats your emotions, well, consider when did that last work for you? And how long does it work for? A minute? Two minutes? Does the thing that you think you need right now because of X emotion, does that thing actually taste like you think it's going to? Is it truly as good as you think it is? Or are you just telling yourself that because you've got this story running? These are the stories that make us overeat. These are the stories that we run in our subconscious, which is where most of you lives, right? It's the part that gets in the car and drives you to work without thinking about the turns you're going to take. It's the automatic routines, the habits, all of that's in your subconscious. Well, emotional ties to eating, those are in your subconscious too. And the tendency to overeat right there. Like, what's your story? Do you have to eat now before you go out just in case you get hungry later? That might sound funny unless you're somebody who's experienced that. But I know people who have that story running because their mom used to say it to them or, you know, their dad or they'd hear it at school or something. Eat this. If you don't eat it, you might be hungry later. If you examine that concept, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? We live in a society where food is available everywhere. It's abundant all over the place. Yes, I know there are countries where that's not the case. I'm not talking about those right now. They're probably not listening to me either. I'm talking to you, the person who can go down to the local store and buy a whole bundle of, you know, bags of chips and chocolate and, you know, cans of pop, all the things, right? You can go get those anytime. So what is the fear behind, I might be hungry later? It's not a disaster if you're hungry. In fact, here's something else that ties into the overeating. We don't get hungry. People don't leave time to be hungry, to feel that. There's like a fear of feeling hungry. There's a, there's a concern that that might be uncomfortable. I won't like it. And a big part of where that story comes from is the marketing. It's in, this, it's in media all over the place. There's, they're marketing you a lifestyle. They are marketing you a feeling of, always being satisfied, never having a moment's discomfort or a moment's, you know, hunger. And newsflash is hunger doesn't have to be uncomfortable. It depends on what you're thinking at the time, right? I recently did a three-day water fast, no food for three days, just water. And I was fine. Not only did I not die, but it wasn't an emergency. I didn't feel sick. I was able to sleep and my digestive system had a break. And that's something we don't do for our bodies. We don't give them a break. Your digestive system does not need to be working all day long, but that's what we do. We don't get hungry. We keep eating. This is where emotional eating comes in and this is where overeating comes in. If you think of your, well, think of your grandparents even. Did they eat all the time? Did they eat the way you're eating or do you have more ready access to instant food and think nothing of just downing some because, hey, it's is it that time already or I'm watching a movie. Therefore, you know, how much do you eat when you're watching movies? There's a lot of mindless food consumption that goes on or I should say food product consumption. I'm, I'm very particular about distinguishing between real food that the body can use and the products that are actually slowly poisoning you. And those are the things, the latter are the things that we typically eat when we're watching movies. Is that wild? Like you're just consuming all these chemicals while you watch a movie and then you probably don't even remember having eaten them later. That's overeating right there. We're at the next break. 
this time is as ever going so fast because I have so many things to tell you. And when we come back, I'll remind you again of where you can contact me and what my program looks like. We start on May 13th. So if you're interested, stay tuned. I have something good for you. See you in a minute. What if your relationships could be a source of delight instead of a source of struggle? In a world where human interactions are anything but straightforward, tuning in to Navigating Complicated Relationships with behavior expert Michaela Gaffin-Stone will offer you insights, tools, and a whole new level of understanding for you to use right now. Listen for Navigating Complicated Relationships with Michaela Gaffin-Stone, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. This is Navigating Complicated Relationships with Michaela Gaffin-Stone. To participate in the program, join the live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also send an email to Mickey at GaffinStone.com. Now back to the program. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're still here. That means you're still interested. That's how I'm going to take it. Okay. So if you want to email me, it's mickey at gaffinstone.com. And Mickey is M-I-K-K-I. And you already know by now that I'm not a mouse. At gaffinstone, that's two Fs. Stone is like a rock, dot com. And I love to get emails. But you can also find me on Facebook. I post all kinds of things on there from terrible dad jokes to tips that you can use, questions, pictures, you know the thing. There's lots going on there. I don't usually tell you what I have for breakfast, though. So if you're interested, you'd have to ask me. And then I'd be curious as to why you were interested. But I digress. So you can contact me and I will be very happy to hear from you. On May 13, I'm starting another 90 day coaching journey with a few clients. I don't want too many because it's very personal and it's I'm very hands on. Like I want to be there to fully support the people who come to me through their journey because there's so much learning going on. And I really want to make that 90 days transformational in a very real way. And I know the words bandied around a lot, but if you talk to some of the people that I've worked with, they will tell you that they have undergone some significant transformations following this coaching journey. You learn about nutrition, yes, but the nutrition is like the hat on top. The behavioral stuff, as I mentioned in the beginning, that is the thing that most people are missing. And when it comes to traditional diets, they don't address that at all. They have no idea about that. They just try and tell you to use your willpower, force the issue. And then when your willpower fails, because it's a tiny muscle about this big, when your willpower fails, which it must, then, you know, it's your fault and, and you have failed the diet and this is a mentality that you know I like to work with people on that right in the beginning before we even get going on the 90 days so if you sign up on the wait list I'm going to start sending you stuff about mindset and understanding that if you are overweight or if you have emotional eating problems you overeat it is actually not your fault and I'm not blowing smoke here this is serious it's not your fault it's the chemicals that trigger the appetite that are put in the food. It is a big time, the marketing. You know, you're sold a lifestyle on TV. You're sold a lifestyle when you look on social media. And you're, you're given the chemicals to make you want to eat more of those things. It's there all the time. You don't, you don't consciously think, oh, yeah, I want to eat Cheerios so that I have a perfectly clean kitchen and even the dog doesn't shed and everybody's smiling and the kids are happy to go to school. Cool. Does that happen really? They, they don't tell you that that's what you're going to get. But the one thing that you can buy in that whole advertisement is the breakfast cereal, right? Or it's the, the burrito or the whatever food they're advertising. But the whole thing is a lifestyle until you look at the one thing you can buy. And that's how marketing really speaks to you where you live. Like, hey, if you're not happy with your life, you could be living like this. You just have to eat these things. You just have to buy these things, right? Now, there's food addiction. 
and and that is an intentional thing on the part of the food companies it truly is that's why they put sugar in everything i don't know if you're aware by now if you've listened to me before chances are you do know that there are 257 names of sugar 257 now seriously why is there 257 names of sugar is it because sugar is good for you mm, i'm gonna say no is it because they're doing you some kind of favor no it's because when you look at the food label not the sort of x amount of fat x amount of protein etc look at the list of ingredients and you could have sugar in eight different places for example if they're using different names first of all you might not know you're looking at sugar secondly it comes further down the ingredient list because the ingredient list goes by most prominent to the next one to the next one to the next one so by splitting up the sugar they use into different names it, it can be probably the first ingredient on the list but it comes way lower because you don't know what you're looking at because they've split it up there are so many things that the food industry do to trick you it's sad but this is how they operate this is how they make their billions and there's not a lot you can do about it other than vote with your dollars. Don't buy that stuff. Get wise to what they're doing to you. And, you know, really do some research. Like, get curious. What is on that label? What do you think you just read? Because sometimes they'll say no fat. What that means is there's less, just less than half a gram of fat per serving. So if you have a small bag of potato chips and it says on the label 13 servings, which is probably like three chips, then and, and it also says no fat or fat free, something like that. That's how they're getting around the labeling rules. They can say that because per serving is less than half a gram. So actually, you could have like five grams in there, six grams, which is a lot. And you don't know you're getting it because it doesn't say so on the label. So don't, you can't trust what you see, but it will make you overeat because you just don't know what you're getting, right? And did you know also that the food labels can be plus or minus 20% accuracy? I'm gonna say they're usually gonna go down on the calories, so they'll tell you there's 20% less than there is. So if you're trying to count the calories, which I'm not a big fan of, but you know, hey, if you're trying to do that, you could be running into trouble right away. So again, I invite you to book a conversation with me. And, you know, if you want to move forward and do something about emotional eating, I'm here for you. And if you don't, I can give you some resources that you can go play with yourself and have a look at. It's up to you. I really want everybody to be informed about what's happening because it's only when you vote with your dollars and you don't buy this stuff that we can make a difference and stop having it sold everywhere and maybe not feed it to our kids. Kids are getting sick early and they're getting sick with older people's problems. Again, when I first became a nurse, I never saw a child with type 2 diabetes. This was not a thing. This did not happen. And now it's so commonplace, it is depressing and scary. And why is this happening? Again, I'm going to say it's the food people are eating that is nutritionally lacking and the food industry are putting stuff in there that frankly is unscrupulous and they shouldn't be getting away with it. But they do because the Food and Drug Administration, there's probably two people in a basement somewhere. You know, they are underfunded. They're not given a mandate to check everything. And there's new products coming out all the time. So how could they? They don't is the short version. Companies self-report. Well, you want to trust a company to self-report, knock yourself out, but I'm going to say you'll get the results you're currently getting if you do that. So become aware, really do your research. Come talk to me if you want to know more from me. As you can tell, I'm happy to talk about it all day long. I got lots to say and I have lots of research to back it up. And I want you to be the healthiest version of you that you can possibly be and definitely raising your kids to be healthy, happy human beings. Isn't that what we all want, really? It's just the food industry led us astray.
I'll see you next time on Navigating Complicated Relationships. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Navigating Complicated Relationship Show. Makaila returns Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Until then, remember every relationship is a journey. And with the right tools, you can create stronger, more fulfilling connections.